Book Three, Chapter Five of Armadale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Armadale by Wilkie Collins. Chapter Five, Pedgift's Remedy. After waiting to hold a preliminary consultation with his son, Mister Pedgift the elder set forth alone for his interview with Allan at the great house. Allowing for the difference in their ages, the son was, in this instance, so accurately the reflection of the father, that an acquaintance with either of the two Pedgifts was almost equivalent to an acquaintance with both. Add some little height and size to the figure of Pedgift Jr., give more breadth and boldness to his humor, and some additional solidity and composure to his confidence in himself and the presence and character of pedgift senior stood for all general purposes revealed before you the lawyer's conveyance to thorpe ambrose was his own smart gig drawn by his famous fast-trotting mare it was his habit to drive himself and it was one among the trifling external peculiarities in which he and his son differed a little to affect something of the sporting character in his dress the drab trousers of pedgift the elder fitted close to his legs his boots in dry weather and wet alike were equally thick in the sole his coat pockets overlapped his hips and his favorite summer cravat was of light spotted muslin tied in the neatest and smallest of bows he used tobacco like his son but in a different form while the younger man smoked the elder took snuff copiously and it was noticed among his intimates that he always held his pinch in a state of suspense between his box and his nose when he was going to clinch a good bargain or to say a good thing the art of diplomacy enters largely into the practice of all successful men in the lower branch of the law mr pedgift's form of diplomatic practice had been the same throughout his life on every occasion when he found his arts of persuasion required at an interview with another man he invariably kept his strongest argument or his boldest proposal to the last and invariably remembered it at the door after previously taking his leave as if it was a purely accidental consideration which had that instant occurred to him jocular friends acquainted by previous experience with this form of proceeding had given it the name of pedgift's postscript there were few people in thorpe ambrose who did not know what it meant when the lawyer suddenly checked his exit at the open door came back softly to his chair with his pinch of snuff suspended between his box and his nose said by the by there's a point occurs to me and settled the question off-hand after having given it up in despair not a minute before this was the man whom the march of events at thorpe ambrose had now thrust capriciously into a foremost place this was the one friend at hand to whom allan in his social isolation could turn for counsel in the hour of need good evening mr armadale many thanks for your prompt attention to my very disagreeable letter said pedgift senior opening the conversation cheerfully the moment he entered his client's house i hope you understand sir that i had really no choice under the circumstances but to write as i did i have very few friends mr pedgift returned allan simply and i am sure you are one of the few much obliged mr armadale i have always tried to deserve your good opinion and i mean if i can to deserve it now you found yourself comfortable i hope sir at the hotel in london we call it our hotel some rare old wine in the cellar which i should have introduced to your notice if i had had the honor of being with you my son unfortunately knows nothing about wine allan felt his false position in the neighborhood far too acutely to be capable of talking of anything but the main business of the evening his lawyer's politely roundabout method of approaching the painful subject to be discussed between them rather irritated than composed him he came at once to the point in his own bluntly straightforward way the hotel was very comfortable mr pedgift and your son was very kind to me but we are not in london now and 
I want to talk to you about how I am to meet the lies that are being told of me in this place. Only point me out any one man, cried Alan, with a rising voice and a mounting color. Any one man who says I am afraid to show my face in the neighborhood, and I'll horsewhip him publicly, before another day is over his head. Pedgift Sr. helped himself to a pinch of snuff, and held it calmly in suspense, midway between his box and his nose. "'You can horsewhip a man, sir, but you can't horsewhip a neighborhood," said the lawyer, in his politely epigrammatic manner. "'We will fight our battle, if you please, without borrowing our weapons of the coachman yet a while, at any rate.' "'But how are we to begin?' asked Allan, impatiently. "'How am I to contradict the infamous things they say of me?' there are two ways of stepping out of your present awkward position sir a short way and a long way replied pedgift senior the short way which is always the best has occurred to me since i have heard of your proceedings in london from my son i understand that you permitted him after you received my letter to take me into your confidence i have drawn various conclusions from what he has told me which i may find it necessary to trouble you with presently in the meantime i should be glad to know under what circumstances you went to london to make these unfortunate inquiries about miss gwilt was it your own notion to pay that visit to mrs mandeville or were you acting under the influence of some other person allan hesitated i can't honestly tell you it was my own notion he replied and said no more i thought as much remarked pedgift senior in high triumph the short way out of our present difficulty mr armadale lies straight through that other person under whose influence you acted that other person must be presented forthwith to public notice and must stand in that other person's proper place the name if you please sir to begin with we'll come to the circumstances directly i am sorry to say mr pedgift that we must try the longest way if you have no objection replied allan quietly the short way happens to be a way i can't take on this occasion the men who rise in the law are the men who decline to take no for an answer mr pedgift the elder had risen in the law and mr pedgift the elder now declined to take no for an answer but all pertinacity even professional pertinacity included sooner or later finds its limits and the lawyer doubly fortified as he was by long experience and copious pinches of snuff found his limits at the very outset of the interview it was impossible that allan could respect the confidence which mrs milroy had treacherously affected to place in him but he had an honest man's regard for his own pledged word the regard which looks straight forward at the fact and which never glances sidelong at the circumstances and the utmost persistency of pedgift senior failed to move him a hair-breadth from the position which he had taken up no is the strongest word in the english language in the mouth of any man who has the courage to repeat it often enough and allan had the courage to repeat it often enough on this occasion very good sir said the lawyer accepting his defeat without the slightest loss of temper the choice rests with you and you have chosen we will go the long way it starts allow me to inform you from my office and it leads as i strongly suspect through a very miry road to miss gwilt allan looked at his legal adviser in speechless astonishment if you want to expose the person who is responsible in the first instance sir for the inquiries to which you unfortunately let yourself proceeded mr pedgift the elder the only other alternative in your present position is to justify the inquiries themselves and how is that to be done inquired allan by proving to the whole neighborhood mr armadale what i firmly believe to be the truth that the pet object of the public protection is an adventuress of the worst class an undeniably worthless and dangerous woman in plainer english still sir by employing time enough and money enough to discover the truth about miss gwilt before allan could say a word in answer there was an interruption at the door after the usual preliminary knock one of the servants came in i told you i was not to be interrupted 
said Allan, irritably. "'Good heavens! Am I never to have done with them? Another letter!' "'Yes, sir,' said the man, holding it out. "'And,' he added, speaking words of evil omen in his master's ears, "'the person waits for an answer.' Allan looked at the address of the letter, with a natural expectation of encountering the handwriting of the major's wife. The anticipation was not realized. His correspondent was plainly a lady, but the lady was not Mrs. Milroy. "'Who can it be?' he said, looking mechanically at Pedgift Sr. as he opened the envelope. Pedgift Sr. gently tapped his snuff-box, and said, without a moment's hesitation, "'Miss Gwilt!' Allan opened the letter. The first two words in it were the echo of the two words the lawyer had just pronounced. It was Miss Gwilt. Once more Allan looked at his legal adviser in speechless astonishment. "'I have known a good many of them in my time, sir,' explained Pedgift Sr., with a modesty equally rare and becoming in a man of his age. "'Not as handsome as Miss Gwilt, I admit, but quite as bad, I dare say. Read your letter, Mr. Armadale. Read your letter.' Allan read these lines. Miss Gwilt presents her compliments to Mr. Armadale, and begs to know if it will be convenient to him to favor her with an interview, either this evening or to-morrow morning. Miss Gwilt offers no apology for making her present request. She believes Mr. Armadale will grant it as an act of justice toward a friendless woman, whom he has been innocently the means of injuring, and who is earnestly desirous to set herself right in his estimation. Allan handed the letter to his lawyer, in silent perplexity and distress. The face of Mr. Pedgift the Elder expressed but one feeling when he had read the letter in his turn and had handed it back, a feeling of profound admiration. "'What a lawyer she would have made!' he exclaimed fervently. "'If she had only been a man!' "'I can't treat this as lightly as you do, Mr. Pedgift,' said Allan. "'It's dreadfully distressing to me.' i was so fond of her he added in a lower tone i was so fond of her once mr pedgift senior suddenly became serious on his side do you mean to say sir that you actually contemplate seeing miss gwilt he asked with an expression of genuine dismay i can't treat her cruelly returned allan i have been the means of injuring her without intending it god knows I can't treat her cruelly after that. Mr. Armadale, said the lawyer, you did me the honor, a little while since, to say that you considered me your friend. May I presume on that position to ask you a question or two before you go straight to your own ruin? Any questions you like, said Allan, looking back at the letter, the only letter he had ever received from Miss Gwilt. You have had one trap set for you already, sir, and you have fallen into it. Do you want to fall into another? You know the answer to that question, Mr. Pedgift, as well as I do. I'll try again, Mr. Armadale. We lawyers are not easily discouraged. Do you think that any statement Miss Gwilt might make to you, if you do see her, would be a statement to be relied on, after what you and my son discovered in London? She might explain what we discovered in London, suggested Allan still looking at the writing and thinking of the hand that had traced it might explain it my dear sir she is quite certain to explain it i will do her justice i believe she would make out a case without a single flaw in it from beginning to end that last answer forced allan's attention away from the letter the lawyer's pitiless common sense showed him no mercy if you see that woman again sir proceeded pedgift senior you will commit the rashest act of folly I ever heard of in all my experience. She can have but one object in coming here, to practice on your weakness for her. Nobody can say into what false step she may not lead you, if you once give her the opportunity. You admit yourself that you have been fond of her. Your attentions to her have been the subject of general remark. If you haven't actually offered her the chance of becoming Mrs. Armadale, you have done the next thing to it and knowing all this, you propose to see her, and to let her work on you with her devilish beauty and her devilish cleverness, 
in the character of your interesting victim you who are one of the best matches in england you who are the natural prey of all the hungry single women in the community i never heard the like of it i never in all my professional experience heard the like of it if you must positively put yourself in a dangerous position mr armadale concluded pedgift the elder with the everlasting pinch of snuff held in suspense between his box and his nose there's a wild beast show coming to our town next week let in the tiger sir don't let in miss gwilt for the third time allan looked at his lawyer and for the third time his lawyer looked back at him quite unabashed you seem to have a very bad opinion of miss gwilt said allan the worst possible opinion mr armadale retorted pedgift senior coolly we will return to that when we have sent the lady's messenger about his business will you take my advice will you decline to see her i would willingly decline it would be so dreadfully distressing to both of us said allan i would willingly decline if only i knew how bless my soul mr armadale it's easy enough don't commit you yourself in writing send out to the messenger and say there's no answer the short course thus suggested was a course which allan positively declined to take it's treating her brutally he said i can't and won't do it once more the pertinacity of pedgift the elder found its limits and once more that wise man yielded gracefully to a compromise on receiving his client's promise not to see miss gwilt he consented to allan's committing himself in writing under his lawyer's dictation the letter thus produced was modelled in allan's own style it began and ended in one sentence mr armadale presents his compliments to miss gwilt and regrets that he cannot have the pleasure of seeing her at thorpe ambrose allan had pleaded hard for a second sentence explaining that he only declined miss gwilt's request from a conviction that an interview would be needlessly distressing on both sides but his legal adviser firmly rejected the proposed addition to the letter when you say no to a woman sir remarked pedgift senior always say it in one word if you give her your reasons she invariably believes that you mean yes producing that little gem of wisdom from the rich mine of his professional experience mr pedgift the elder sent out the answer to miss gwilt's messenger and recommended the servant to see the fellow whoever he was well clear of the house now sir said the lawyer we will come back if you like to my opinion of miss gwilt it doesn't at all agree with yours i'm afraid you think her an object of pity quite natural at your age i think her an object for the inside of a prison quite natural at mine you shall hear the grounds on which i have formed my opinion directly let me show you that i am in earnest by putting the opinion itself in the first place to a practical test do you think miss gwilt is likely to persist in paying you a visit mr armadale after the answer you have just sent to her quite impossible cried allan warmly miss gwilt is a lady after the letter i have sent to her she will never come near me again there we join issue sir cried pedgift senior i say she will snap her fingers at your letter which was one of the reasons why i objected to your writing it i say she is in all probability waiting her messenger's return in or near your grounds at this moment i say she will try to force her way in here before four-and-twenty hours more are over your head egad sir cried mr pedgift looking at his watch it's only seven o'clock now she's bold enough and clever enough to catch you unawares this very evening permit me to ring for the servant permit me to request that you will give him orders immediately to say you are not at home you needn't hesitate mr armadale if you're right about miss gwilt it's a mere formality if i'm right it's a wise precaution back your opinion sir said mr pedgift ringing the bell i back mine allan was sufficiently nettled when the bell rang to feel ready to give the order but when the servant came in past remembrances got the better of him and the words stuck in his throat you give the order he said to mr pedgift and walked away abruptly to the window you're a good fellow 
thought the old lawyer, looking after him, and penetrating his motive on the instant. The claws of that she-devil shan't scratch you, if I can help it. The servant waited inexorably for his orders. If Miss Gwilt calls here, either this evening or at any other time, said Pedgift Sr., Mr. Armadale is not at home. Wait. If she asks when Mr. Armadale will be back, you don't know. Wait. If she proposes coming in and sitting down, you have a general order that nobody is to come in and sit down, unless they have a previous appointment with Mr. Armadale. Come, cried old Pedgift, rubbing his hands cheerfully when the servant had left the room. I have stopped her out now, at any rate. The orders are all given, Mr. Armadale. We may go on with our conversation. Allan came back from the window. The conversation is not a very pleasant one, he said. No offense to you, but I wish it was over. We will get it over as soon as possible, sir, said Pedgift Sr., still persisting, as only lawyers and women can persist, in forcing his way, little by little, nearer and nearer to his own object. Let us go back, if you please, to the practical suggestion which I offered you when the servant came in with Miss Gwilt's note. There is, I repeat, only one way left for you, Mr. Armadale, out of your present awkward position. You must pursue your inquiries about this woman to an end. On the chance, which I consider next to a certainty, that the end will justify you in the estimation of the neighborhood. I wish to God I had never made any inquiries at all, said Allan. Nothing will induce me, Mr. Pedgift, to make any more. Why? asked the lawyer. Can you ask me why? retorted Allan, hotly. After your son has told you what we found out in London. Even if I had less cause to be, to be sorry for Miss Gwilt than I have, even if it was some other woman, do you think I would inquire any further into the secret of a poor betrayed creature, much less expose it to the neighborhood? I should think myself as great a scoundrel as the man who has cast her out helpless on the world, if I did anything of the kind. I wonder you can ask me the question. Upon my soul, I wonder you can ask me the question. Give me your hand, Mr. Armadale, cried Pedgift Sr., warmly. I honor you for being so angry with me. The neighborhood may say what it pleases. You are a gentleman, sir, in the best sense of the word. Now, pursued the lawyer, dropping Allan's hand and lapsing back instantly from sentiment to business. Just hear what I have got to say in my own defense. Suppose Miss Gwilt's real position happens to be nothing like what you are generously determined to believe it to be. We have no reason to suppose that said Allan, resolutely. "'Such is your opinion, sir,' persisted Pedgift. "'Mine, founded on what is publicly known of Miss Gwilt's proceedings here, and on what I have seen of Miss Gwilt herself, is that she is as far as I am from being the sentimental victim you are inclined to make her out. "'Gently, Mr. Armadale, remember that I have put my opinion to a practical test, and wait to condemn it off-hand.' until events have justified you. Let me put my points, sir. Make allowances for me as a lawyer, and let me put my points. You and my son are young men, and I don't deny that the circumstances on the surface appear to justify the interpretation which, as young men, you have placed on them. I am an old man. I know that circumstances are not always to be taken as they appear on the surface and I possess the great advantage, in the present case, of having had years of professional experience among some of the wickedest women who ever walked this earth. Allan opened his lips to protest, and checked himself, in despair of producing the slightest effect. Pedgift Sr. bowed in polite acknowledgment of his client's self-restraint, and took instant advantage of it to go on. All Miss Gwilt's proceedings, he resumed, since your unfortunate correspondence with the Major, show me that she is an old hand at deceit. The moment she is threatened with exposure, exposure of some kind, there can be no doubt, after what you discovered in London. 
she turns your honourable silence to the best possible account, and leaves the major's service in the character of a martyr. Once out of the house, what does she do next? She boldly stops in the neighbourhood, and serves three excellent purposes by doing so. In the first place, she shows everybody that she is not afraid of facing another attack on her reputation. In the second place, she is close at hand to twist you round her little finger, and to become Mrs. Armadale, in spite of circumstances, if you and I allow her the opportunity. In the third place, if you and I are wise enough to distrust her, she is equally wise on her side, and doesn't give us the first great chance of following her to London, and associating her with her accomplices. Is this the conduct of an unhappy woman? who has lost her character in a moment of weakness, and who has been driven unwillingly into a deception to get it back again. "'You put it cleverly,' said Allan, answering with marked reluctance. "'I can't deny that you put it cleverly.' "'Your own common sense, Mr. Armadale, is beginning to tell you that I put it justly,' said Pedgift Sr. "'I don't presume to say yet what this woman's connection may be with those people at Pimlico.' All I assert is that it is not the connection you suppose. Having stated the fact so far, I have only to add my own personal impression of Miss Gwilt. I won't shock you, if I can help it. I'll try if I can't put it cleverly again. She came to my office, as I told you in my letter, no doubt to make friends with your lawyer, if she could. She came to tell me in the most forgiving and Christian manner that she didn't blame you. "'Do you ever believe anybody, Mr. Pedgift?' interposed Allan. "'Sometimes, Mr. Armadale,' returned Pedgift the Elder, as unabashed as ever. "'I believe as often as a lawyer can. "'To proceed, sir, when I was in the criminal branch of practice, "'it fell to my lot to take instructions for the defense of women, "'committed for trial from the women's own lips. "'Whatever other difference there might be among them, "'I got in time to notice among those who were particularly wicked and unquestionably guilty. One point in which they all resembled each other. Tall and short, old and young, handsome and ugly, they all had a secret self-possession that nothing could shake. On the surface they were as different as possible. Some of them were in a state of indignation, some of them were drowned in tears, some of them were full of pious confidence and some of them were resolved to commit suicide before the night was out. But only put your finger suddenly on the weak point in the story told by any one of them, and there was an end of her rage, or her tears, or her piety, or her despair. And out came the genuine woman, in full possession of all her resources, with a neat little lie that exactly suited the circumstances of the case. Miss Gwilt was in tears, sir, becoming tears that didn't make her nose red, and I put my finger suddenly on the weak point in her story. Down dropped her pathetic pocket-handkerchief from her beautiful blue eyes, and out came the genuine woman, with the neat little lie that exactly suited these circumstances. I felt twenty years younger, Mr. Armadale, on the spot. I declare I thought I was in Newgate again, with my notebook in my hand, taking my instructions for the defense. "'The next thing you'll say, Mr. Pedgift,' cried Allan angrily, "'is that Miss Gwilt has been in prison.' Pedgift Sr. calmly wrapped his snuff-box, and had his answer ready at a moment's notice. "'She may have richly deserved to see the inside of a prison, Mr. Armadale, but in the age we live in, that is one excellent reason for her never having been near any place of the kind. A prison, in the present tender state of public feeling, for a charming woman like Miss Gwilt. My dear sir, if she had attempted to murder you or me, and if an inhuman judge and jury had decided on sending her to prison, the first object of modern society would be to prevent her going into it. And, if that couldn't be done, the next object would be to let her out again as soon as possible. Read your newspaper, Mr. Armadale, and you'll find we live in piping times for the black sheep of the community if they are only black enough. I insist on asserting, sir, that 
we have got one of the blackest of the lot to deal with in this case i insist on inserting that you have had the rare luck in these unfortunate inquiries to pitch on a woman who happens to be a fit object for inquiry in the interest of the public protection differ with me as strongly as you please but don't make up your mind finally about miss gwilt until events have put those two opposite opinions of ours to the test that i have proposed a fairest test there can't be i agree with you that no lady worthy of the name could attempt to force her way in here after receiving your letter but i deny that miss gwilt is worthy of the name and i say she will try to force her way in here in spite of you and i say she won't retorted allan firmly pedgift senior leaned back in his chair and smiled there was a momentary silence and in that silence the door-bell rang the lawyer and the client both looked expectantly in the direction of the hall no cried allan more angrily than ever yes cried pedgift senior contradicting him with the utmost politeness they waited the event the opening of the house door was audible but the room was too far from it for the sound of voices to reach the ear as well after a long interval of expectation the closing of the door was heard at last allan rose impetuously and rang the bell mr pedgift the elder sat sublimely calm and enjoyed with a gentle zest the largest pinch of snuff he had taken yet anybody for me asked allan when the servant came in the man looked at pedgift senior with an expression of unutterable reverence and answered miss gwilt i don't want to crow over you sir said mr pedgift the elder when the servant had withdrawn but what do you think of miss gwilt now allan shook his head in silent discouragement and distress time is of importance mr armadale after what has just happened do you still object to taking the course i have had the honor of suggesting to you i can't mr pedgift said allan i can't be the means of disgracing her in the neighborhood i would rather be disgraced myself as i am let me put it in another way sir excuse my persisting you have been very kind to me and my family and i have a personal interest as well as a professional interest in you if you can't prevail on yourself to show this woman's character in its true light will you take common precautions to prevent her doing any more harm will you consent to having her privately watched as long as she remains in this neighborhood for the second time allan shook his head is that your final resolution sir it is mr pedgift but i am much obliged to you for your advice all the same pedgift senior rose in a state of gentle resignation and took up his hat good evening sir he said and made sorrowfully for the door allan rose on his side innocently supposing that the interview was at an end persons better acquainted with the diplomatic habits of his legal adviser would have recommended him to keep his seat the time was ripe for pedgift's postscript and the lawyer's indicative snuff-box was at that moment in one of his hands as he opened the door with the other good evening said allan pedgift senior opened the door stopped considered closed the door again came back mysteriously with his pinch of snuff in suspense between his box and his nose and repeating his invariable formula by the by there's a point occurs to me quietly resumed possession of his empty chair allan wondering took the seat in his turn which he had just left lawyer and client looked at each other once more and the inexhaustible interview began again End of chapter five